Hello and welcome to Innovative in Education's Organic Chemistry Series. My name is Mike Evans and I'll be your guide through the wonderful world of organic chemistry this semester. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion of the proton transfer step. And remember, as we traverse through Chapter 4 of the Wiki, our focus is on the elementary mechanistic steps of organic chemistry, so the fundamental building blocks of chemical reactions that organic chemists tend to think about. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion of proton transfer, which you'll remember last time we defined as the movement of a proton, a positively charged particle in the nucleus, from one atom to another. So just to review shortly, we noted that charged species determine the equilibrium of acid-base reactions. So in other words, more stable charged species are the ones that dictate the position where an equilibrium will lie, whether it be on the left or right-hand side. Last time we looked at the stability of anions, and we saw that three factors primarily controlled anion stability. These were solvent effects, delocalization, and hybridization. Electronegativity is also important for the stability of anions, and we'll see that in this lesson as well. Cation stability is what we're going to look at today, and it's due primarily to three factors, hybridization, delocalization, and hyperconjugation. In this lesson, we'll take a deeper look at these three factors and move on to talk about the processes of acidity and proton transfer in more detail. So what you see on this slide is a typical cationic acid. So up here on the right is a positively charged nitrogen, possesses four bonds. Nitrogen likes to have five electrons, so it's missing one, therefore it's positively charged. And it can give up a proton through this red curved arrow here to produce the neutral nitrogen compound that you see here. Now we can ask the question for this equilibrium that's above my head, which side is favored? And how acidic is this positively charged nitrogen? We'd like to know these things because we'd like to know the relative reactivity of this compound with respect to others that we might use in combination with this compound. So for instance, if we were to mix this positively charged ammonium group with, say, a positively charged oxygen or a neutral oxygen, where would the proton end up? Would it end up predominantly on the oxygen or on the nitrogen? These are important things that we need to know in considerations of chemical reactivity. So as organic chemists, we strive to answer these questions. And really, we can boil this question down to the simple idea, how stable is the cation? So I see myself standing in front of this here. How stable is the cation is really the important question here. And that's because it's the stability of the charged species, once again, that determines the direction of an acid-base equilibrium. So it's really going to be this unique charged species here, the charged ammonium group, that's going to determine how acidic it actually is. The more stable this is, the less reactive we'll see it will be. The less stable this is, the more reactive and more acidic we'll see it becomes. And just like anions, there are actually four primary factors that control the stability of cations. Hyperconjugation, hybridization, and delocalization. And right now, I'd like to look at these three factors, these four factors, excuse me, in detail so that we can get a look at the factors that control cations and think about cations in the context of acidity and proton transfer. So the first factor involved here is delocalization. And by delocalization, I mean the spread of positive charge, in this particular case, over a large number of atoms. If you take a look at the central box here, what you can see is that in the bottom structure, there are no resonance structures to spread the positive charge around. So that positive charge is localized on this central carbon atom. However, if we introduce an electron donor adjacent to the positive charge, in the top case, we've done that by the introduction of the pi bond. We're now in a situation where the positive charge is delocalized over two atoms, the central atom that is positively charged down here as well, but also the terminal carbon. And this resonance structure on the left-hand side shows you this. As a result of that extra resonance structure, the allyl cation, which is the name of this cation, is stabilized relative to the cation shown below, which is much more unhappy because it has only one resonance structure. 
A couple of other examples that you may run into are shown on this slide. The example on the far right here is that of the protonated amide. So an amide is a carbonyl group with a nitrogen attached to the carbonyl carbon. And what you can see from this top structure is that the nitrogen of the amide can donate towards the positive charge on the protonated amide. What that does is it delocalizes the positive charge, spreads it out over both nitrogen and oxygen. This stabilizes the amide in its protonated form over other protonated carbonyls like the protonated ketone and even the protonated ester, which isn't quite as good of an electron donor as the amide. And in the bottom case is an intermediate that you may run into in studies of what's called aromatic chemistry. Aromatic compounds are a special class of cyclic conjugated molecules and many times uh, aromatic compounds can get protonated or react with other electron acceptors in order to produce cationic intermediates. One of those is shown here. What you can see is that the double bonds that are in conjugation or adjacent to the positive charge can both donate towards that positive charge. So I'm showing on the left here one particular, or I guess on your right, one particular resonance structure um, based on these curved arrows, but there are others that you can imagine, not just within the ring, but possibly from the oxygen atom down here as well. So these three examples all tell us that delocalization stabilizes cations. Experimental results have borne this out. So for instance, from experimental results, we can tell that the protonated amide, for instance, is more acidic than a protonated, excuse me, less acidic than a protonated ketone or a protonated ester. This suggests that the amide is more stable as the cation. It's less willing to give up its positive charge and become neutral again, whereas the more reactive, less stable protonated carbonyls are less willing to hold on to their positive charge. The second factor associated with, um, with the stability of cations is hybridization. And very quickly, hybridization refers to the hybridization of the empty orbital in the cation. And this is a very important point to grasp. Positive or, or empty orbitals want to be as far away from the nucleus as possible in order to be as stable as possible. In a sense, the empty orbital is holding the positive charge, and the farther away it is from a positively charged nucleus, the more stable it is. This is why we observe, and again, this is something that can be borne out through experiment, that normal alkyl cations without geometric constraints are flat. They're perfectly flat because they want their empty orbital to possess as much p character as possible. They can achieve this by making that empty orbital into essentially a p-type orbital with no s-character whatsoever. Introducing hybridization into the equation complicates things a little bit, and we'll take a look at that in more detail in the next video.